My name is Dave Ripplinger, Bioenergy Bioproducts Economic Specialist with NDSU Extension and the regular host and moderator of our monthly Egg Market Situation Outlook webinar series. Uh, we're back again for the month of June in 2024. Uh, there'll be four presentations today. Uh, we'll be beginning with Frank Olson, who had to record his uh, presentation due to a, a, another commitment. Uh, so we'll kick off with that. Uh, and then once we're done, we'll save questions for the end. Feel free to use the Q&A tool uh, or the chat if you'd like to ask questions, and we'll get to those. Uh, obviously, Frain won't be here today, uh, but you can definitely reach out to him uh, if you'd like. Uh, with that, I'm going to do my best to turn it over to Frain. Hi, I'm Frain Olson. I'm a crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Um, I'm sorry I can't join you today live. Uh, but I will try and provide my update uh, for the, the out Outlook uh, meeting or Outlook webinar today uh, via recording. So again, I'm, I'm recording this just beforehand. Unfortunately, I had a conflict at one o'clock, so I wouldn't be able to join you uh, directly. So let me pull up my slide and we'll get going. So here's my contact information. If you do have any questions or anything later on that you want to discuss or have have issues with, please don't hesitate to contact me. I got my my uh, work cell number there as well as my email. So let's just dive right in. We're going to talk about the information that came out in the June uh, WASD or World Agricultural Supply Demand Estimates and the production report. Um, so the production report so far only covers winter wheat. We won't get information on the production numbers for corn and soybeans until we get into the July report. And so the July will be the first, uh, con next month will be the first one that we get some information on survey-based estimates for corn and soybean production um, out of USDA. So that'll be watched pretty closely. But this month is primarily focused on the winter wheat production. So we're going to talk about that in just a second here. So just some big key takeaways. Um, first, the, the actually the reports that we got were relatively neutral for corn, soybeans, and wheat. We'll see that in just a few minutes. The private uh, US, if private estimates uh, before the reports came out came out almost exactly at what USDA suggested. Um, and so there was a really good kind of linkage or connection between what the trade was expecting to see and what we actually got in the report. So not, not in any kind of earth shattering or big news. Um, we did have some updates on crop progress reports. So every Monday, we do get information on kind of how the crop is developing, at least a subjective measure of how well the crop is actually performing. So I just wanted to give you a, a brief estimate because this is some of the kind of market psychology. This is kind of the perceptions that the marketplace currently has about the corn, soybean, uh, wheat conditions as we move into the early growth stages of, the, of this year's crop. So I, I recorded what percent of the crop is rated good or excellent. Okay, so we added those two together, what percentage good, what percentage excellent. And for corn, the, the information we got on Monday was about 74% good, excellent versus this time last year, 61%. Soybeans, 72% currently versus 59% last year. Uh, winter wheat, we're currently at about 47% nationally and about 38% this time last year with about 12% of the crop of the winter wheat crop currently harvested, primarily in Texas and, and Oklahoma. The winter wheat harvest now is starting to slowly move into, into the southern parts of Kansas. And then for spring wheat, we're at 72% uh, good, excellent versus about 60% last year. So in general, right now, when we compare this year to the same time last year, a little bit better um, than this time last year. So again, right now, expectations are for a pretty good crop. Um, obviously, there's a lot of growing season left, a lot of weather um, and, and international trade issues potentially that we need to be paying attention to. The other thing later on in, in today's discussion, I'd like to provide a very quick update on the fr frost and drought, drought damage going on in primarily in Russia, but also hitting parts of Ukraine. Um, it, and we're getting some better reports. We're getting some ideas now on the size and the scope of what that uh, problems occurred. I know last month I talked a little bit about it, tried to give you kind of a preview. We're now getting a little bit more information and actually it looks as though that damage may be a bit more severe than we had first thought as, uh, as of this time last month. So very quick, uh, when we look at ending stocks for old crop grain, so this would be the 23, 24 crop. This is old crop. This is the stuff that's in the bin right now. Um, when we look, compare the blue line on top, which, which is what the 
uh, trade analysts and forecasters were expecting to see versus the red line on the very bottom, which is what we actually received. Very, very close synchronization. And again, just as a reference point, the black highlighted or bolded line towards the bottom is what we saw last month. So for wheat, corn, and soybeans, only a small adjustment in old crop ending stocks. Um, USDA did take the crushing number down just a little bit. Um, so the amount of soybeans going to the crush sector for old crop is is was was trimmed just a little bit. That's why you see that adjustment about 10 million bushels uh, compared to this uh, compared to last month's forecast. So no real big shock value in the old crop numbers. Moving into the new crop numbers, notice that the title now, this is for 24, 25. This is the new crop. This is the crop that's growing right now. Uh, again, the estimates we have for both production and consumption are really all forecasts. They're all projections at this stage. Um, as we move through the rest of the growing season, those numbers will be updated and, and added more accuracy. So again, when we compare the blue line on top, which is what the trade was expecting to see, versus the red line on the bottom, which was actually what was reported, very, very similar numbers, very small changes from expectations. And again, when you look at the blue, the black line, which is what was last month's versus this month's, the only adjustment was a small tweak in, in the wheat numbers. And that was really a, a small increase in wheat exports. So a small uptake in the forecasted new crop exports. So again, nothing really new, nothing really stri uh, strategic or important uh, for updates within, within the supply demand numbers. Uh, same thing for South American production. Again, the blue line on top is what the trade was expecting to see. The red line on the bottom is what we actually got. Um, the, I think a lot of the trade analysts and, and, and forecasters are expecting USDA to start taking some of these expectations for, in particular, Brazilian soybeans and to some degree, Argentinian corn down a little bit. Um, traditionally, USDA has been a bit slow to start reducing or, or adjusting these numbers downward. Um, because of weather problems or weather issues. Um, I do think we'll start to see some of that uh, slowly decrease, but I don't know that USDA will get to the low low levels that a lot of the trade forecasters and, and, and analysts are expecting. So I do expect um, maybe some additional downward movement in the Brazilian soybean production. Uh, we don't know about the Brazilian corn. The Safrina corn crop or that second corn crop is just starting their harvest progress right now. They're about 10 to 15% through their uh, corn harvest. And so they're just kind of getting getting going on, on that. We'll, we'll get more information on the Brazilian corn as we move forward. So I don't expect right now to see any major changes. We might start seeing some of those numbers come down in, in probably in August would be my best guess. Not necessarily the July numbers, but maybe in the August numbers. Uh, when we look at wheat production, especially the winter wheat numbers, uh, again, very, very close to what, what the trade was expecting. We did see a slight uptick or increase in the hard red winter wheat forecasts. So last month, they were looking at about seven, uh, 700,000 uh, or 7 million, 0. 0.75, 750 million bushels. We're about 726 million bushels right now. So a small uptick in hard red winter wheat. Uh, which would be, again, the Kansas, Oklahoma, uh, Texas wheat. I think some of the earlier reports we're getting out of Oklahoma in particular, uh, wheat yields are a little bit better than what we had expected. So again, we'll be watching those numbers very closely as we start moving through the winter wheat harvest. Again, no big shock value. Numbers coming up very, very similar to what the trade was expecting to see. So let's dive into what's going on in, in weather and, and kind of yield forecasts and yield projections, not only in Russia, but also in Ukraine. Um, so the, the slides that I'm showing you now are actually out of the USDA uh, report. This is the report, the briefing report to the chief economist. Notice up on the left-hand side, this comes from the office of the chief economist. This is what the, the world board presented to the chief economist before everything was released. So this is kind of the summary of the big changes or some of the big issues that the USDA forecasters are, are working on right now. So when we think about Russian wheat, again, they do produce some spring wheat, but most of that is produced up here in more of the Eastern regions in the Urals, the Volga, and more important into Siberia. So this region up here is really where they produce most of their spring wheat. A lot of that is used domestically. 
Most of the exported wheat, and it counts for about 70% of their total production, notice the blue box, about 70% of all the wheat produced in Russia is winter wheat, what we would classify as a hard red winter wheat. And again, this would be very, very close. This is the Black Sea right down here. This is the Azov Sea right here. Um, so a lot of the wheat is very, very close to the exports, which makes moving it logistically from the, the fields into an elevator, into an export terminal, and then finally onto an ocean going vessel. Very, very simple for the Russians. Okay, so this is where they produce the majority of their winter wheat. Again, the darker the green, the more production is production. Okay, now for Ukraine, this is a map of the Ukrainian by district or obelisk. Now, this red hatched area is going to be the area where the Russians have invaded and are now controlling that production zone. So the, the whatever's red hatched is going to be under Russian control. Okay, now this is historically where Ukrainians have produced most of their wheat. And again, primarily a hard red winter wheat. This is the Black Sea in the very bottom. Again, getting it from the field onto an ocean vessel is relatively straightforward. Although there's been some significant shipping problems coming out of Ukraine, getting into the global market. So when we look at the production zones, most of it's kind of in the southern two thirds of the country. Okay, And again, a large portion of that, about 24% of their total winter wheat production is now controlled by land, controlled by the Russian government. Now, please understand even though there might be some wheat produced in that region, it's the wheat production is going to be pretty minimal because it is in the middle of a war zone. And most of those uh, bushels will flow through the Russian system, not through the Ukrainian system. So let's talk about the weather conditions. So this is the weather report, kind of the, the that, that cold snap they had in the middle of May. So it's been a couple of weeks now, almost a month since we had the freezing conditions. Now, the, the temperatures that you see here are in Celsius. So the scaling on the right-hand side, that light blue is from zero, which would be about 32 to a minus five. And you'll notice the numbers up here, minus four, minus six. These are air temperatures. There's a pocket that was a minus seven. You know, so we're getting down into the upper 20s for, for temperatures. Again, this is about a month ago. And then this map in the very bottom, it shows the darker the green, the more bushels are produced. So this is the Sea of Azov right here. And over on the far left-hand side would be the Black Sea. So just for reference point, here's the Sea of Azov. Here's the Black Sea down here. So again, this region that had that cold snap is really kind of in that central or northern growing regions. So there are parts of the southern growing season, the very south, that it got pretty cold. It did get down into the, into the 30s and 40s, but not cold enough to cause some freeze damage. So at the time that the frost occurred about a month ago, it was in the late jointing stage. So the winter wheat was growing, it, it was starting to develop a head, but the head had not come out of the sheaf. So the, the head had not emerged yet. So the, at least for the winter wheat crop. For the early emerge crops, some of the summer crops, let's say for a corn or for possibly soybeans, a lot of that had not, it, some of it had emerged, but a lot of it had not, okay? Now, what's happened for rain precipitation? So this is the percent of normal precipitation. And notice that again, when we look at the growing region for winter wheat, the darker the green, the more winter wheat bushels are produced. Again, here's the, the Black Sea. Here's the Black Sea on the map. So you're looking at not only the Southern regions of Russia, but also a large portion of Ukraine has had very, very little rainfall during the month of May. So we're looking at you know, 50, 60, a percent, a, a, a basically cut or reduction by 50 or 60 percent of their normal rainfall. So not only did they have that freezing condition, but since then it's been very, very dry. Okay, so again, knowing a little bit about plant gen, plant uh, uh, growth stages and stuff, you'll know that if it's freezing and we get a dry spell, it's very hard for the plant to recover. Now, when we look at temperatures, this is noticed for June uh, 10th. It's a seven day. Uh, average maximum temperature. So this is the heat of the day. And again, this is in Celsius. So we got to look at the conversion factors. So we're looking at the upper 90s and uh, upper 80s and lower 90s for most of the growing region that's been hit not only by the frost damage, but also by that very, very dry condition. So part of this region is going to be in a little bit better condition, but part of it is going to be suffering because of the dry conditions and warmer temperatures. 
So my last two slides is NDVI. So this is a vegetative health. So USDA does satellite imagery. They try and make an estimate of what is the greenness or the health of the crop today relative to what we would normally see. And then they use this greenness me measurement, this vegetative health index, as an estimate for trying to forecast uh, yields and bushels produced. Okay, so this now is is Eastern Europe. This is primarily in the Russian growing regions, all right? And the NDVI. So this is the, the deviation from normal. Is it above normal or below normal? The brownish areas are below normal and the green areas are above, above normal. So you can see that those areas that were not only hot and dry, but also had the frost damage, we're starting to see those that, that crop health really start to suffer. So this month now in June, USDA did cut the forecast for total winter wheat production or total wheat production, excuse me, total wheat production coming out of Russia from 88 million metric ton down to about 83 million metric ton. Now the 83 million metric ton is still above a lot of private estimates. So we do expect as it goes through the rest of the harvest now and the, the crop development and harvest season, that this number of 83 million metric ton will likely be reduced some more as we move into the rest of the growing season. So this has some pretty significant impact, impact psychologically for not only the global wheat market, but also the wheat market here in the US, primarily for those hard red winter wheat classes. And then my final slide is the same kind of NDVI, Vegetative Health Index, for Ukraine. Okay, now, so just understand, this is for the week of June 1 through the June 8th. That's the average for that time period. And we do see that even for those areas of major wheat production in, in Ukraine, some of those areas now are starting to see some stress because of the hotter and drier conditions. Now, USDA did drop, reduce the estimate for wheat production out of Ukraine from 21 million metric ton down to about 19 and a half. So it was a cut. And just for reference, again, we take out those bushels that could be produced and shipped from those areas of the war zone. Um, the record high production, just as a reference point, was in 21-22 marketing year. So that'd be the harvest har that was harvested in 21 and sold in 21-22. The record production, at least recently for Ukrainian output, was 33 million metric ton. They're now down below 20. Again, just for a timing reference, the invasion of uh, the Russian invasion happened in February of 2022. So this was production just before the Russian invasion. So Ukraine has had a pretty significant cutback in not only because of planted area, but also yield and yield potential. Okay. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing. Um, hopefully this information was valuable. We're going to try and give you some more updates on what's happening within that region of the world um, as we move through the rest of the growing season. So again, don't hesitate to reach out and, and um, contact me if you do have any questions. And I do appreciate your time and attention today. All right, Brian, you want to take over? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. A little bit different order today. Um, but uh, I guess what I want to go through here for the, for the, um, the June show um, is that there's been a, a development and it's kind of settled out, I guess, to, to an extent or so we think, uh, in, in May, uh, involving phosphate or phosphorus fertilizers. So I kind of wanted to uh, do a little, little fertilizer outlook, a little mini one here in the summer, uh, specifically focusing on that, what's going on with it, and, and then what uh, we, we might see with that going forward. So I put this up here. This is, uh, I, this is for the week ending uh, six, six, June 7th, so last week. And I only put these on here just to show that for the most part, uh, urea and uh, potash prices, you know, potassium, whatever, those have mostly returned to those pre-pandemic, uh, pre, you know, 2022 record high levels uh, that we saw a couple of years ago when urea was over $1,000 a ton and potash was approaching $900 a ton. And if you look at the red lines on these charts, for the most part, we, we've gone at or, or below the five-year average. And now this five-year average on these two uh, was pulled up because we had a year and a half or so of you know, historically high prices. So naturally that's going to pull that five-year average up because it's a moving average. 
But you can see right now, both of those sit below that five-year average and are, have kind of been just trending along, uh, ranging for the most part within their historical norms. Uh, so involving our nitrogen uh, fertilizers that we use in North Dakota for the most part, and then the potassium side as well. Now, the other side to that, though, is our phosphorus fertilizers, DAP and uh, MAP. And again, these were pulled last week, last Friday, June 7th. And if you look at this, you can see that even though those five-year average prices, much like nitrogen and, and, and potash prices had been pulled up on the five-year average, these phosphorus prices per ton for fertilizer remain relatively high. Uh, you look at, for instance, DAP prices uh, right around $800 a ton in the U.S., comfortably above the five-year average, which, by the way, was also pulled up. So, you know, you go back on a older time horizon, and this was closer to $500 a ton on the five five-year average. So it's considerably more than that now. And then same for same for MAP prices as well, with uh, MAP uh, approaching almost eight hundred and fifty dollars a ton right now, and it's just been moving sideways pretty much all year since Jan, really since last November, just kind of trending sideways. So the question then is, what is going on with phosphorus fertilizers at you know global trade and supply and demand versus uh, urea or nitrogen fertilizers and and potassium components? And the first thing I want to say on that real quick, though, is the U.S. is, a, is an importer of, of phosphorus, phosphorus uh, products. We, we are a net importer of that uh, product. We also import most of our potash as well. Uh, we get most of that from Canada, actually. But we, we import a good share of our, our phosphorus fertilizers. And I put this up here to show the top five rock phosphate producing countries. This was a little older as of 2020. It hasn't changed dramatically, and this is production, not exporting, but production, okay, so how much is produced. Morocco is the by far and away the largest producer of phosphate rocket, uh, almost 28 million metric tons. China, just to almost 10, uh, Russia, seven and a half, Jordan, five and a half, and Tunisia, three and a half. In the U.S., Egypt, and Brazil, and Peru, they produce quite a bit, but but not on the on the level of these countries here that round out the top five. So why do I put that up there? Well, in February of 21, the Commerce Department recommended that the uh, International Trade Commission place a 19% tariff on, on fertilizer from Morocco, stemming from complaints filed by Mosaic, basically that there was some price support and governmental support programs going in, making it non-competitive with, with other phosphorus, namely the stuff produced in the U.S. And when that happened, phosphorus prices rose about 93%. Then in September of 23, the Commerce, De the Commerce Department, and that's different than the ITC, uh, recommended that those tariffs be reduced from 19, oh, let's call it 20% down to two. And then at the same time, Russian phosphorus product tariffs increased from 9% to 28.5. So these are phosphorus products coming into the United States, that tariff going from uh, basically nothing to 19%, 19% uh, to two from Morocco, and then Russian uh, going from 9.2 to 28.5%. Then the Commerce Department, and this is the most recent comment that they had, in early May that it was raised tariffs on phosphorus imports from Morocco, imports from Morocco specifically, to 14.2% from that 2.12 that they'd said back in September of 23. And then it also moved to lower duties on Russian phosphorus uh, phosphate fertilizers to 18.8 from 28.5. Okay. So that's a lot of information on tariffs going up, going down, going back up, going down. But the important thing to remember is, number one, who's the number one phosphorus producer? Morocco. So any tariffs placed on them coming into the U.S. is going to have an outsized impact. And if you look at just how much, this, this just shows it. Exports of world phosph uh, phosphatic fertilizers in 2022, Morocco uh, exported 21% of the world supply, Russia not even quite 2%, 1.8. And then if you look at importers, Brazil imports 38.5%. It's a pretty big chunk. But non-insignificantly, the U.S. imports almost 8.3% of uh, the world's phosphatic fertilizers, or at least they did in 2022. So that's a, that's a notable uh, amount. 
And then the other thing that's happened, you know, you take a major importer and you Im impose a tariff. You look at phosphate rock prices going from January of 2010 into last month, May of 24. And this here on the on the right side of this chart, uh, that's the spike, you know, that we saw in 2022. Phos after that occurred, rock prices have dropped and then they pretty much just plateaued at $150, $150 per, per metric ton. And that's considerably higher, a higher plateau than they've been pretty much from October of 2013 until uh, right before the, all the pandemic stuff and then the shoot uh, the skyrocketing of uh, uh, fertilizer prices. In fact, the last time that it was any higher than it has been over the last six months or so was when fertilizer prices during the big ag boom from 09 all the way through 2013 occurred. And at that point, they, they kind of crested there at $200 a ton as demand for uh, be, because of high corn prices, uh, high soybean prices, high wheat prices, whatever, ever, everything driving that up. And here we sit now, we're back down to commodity prices that look a lot more like 16, 17, 18, but we've got phosphorus prices that look a lot more like, you know, 2013 or even 2010. And when you put a tariff on something coming into the U.S., that makes that product more expensive to the consumers, uh, less of it sold, et cetera. So it, it just raises up the price. So how does that really going to shake out in our in our enterprise budgets and our production costs? So I, I put this little list together here just to, to kind of give a range, because depending on what a, what the yield goal is, the crop that you raise, you know, the region of the country that you live in, how much rain you get, et cetera, that's going to um, have an impact on how much phosphorus is applied and therefore how much you spend on it. But for the most part, as a percentage of operating costs, corn tends to take up, uh, phosphorus tends to take up 7 to 10% of the operating costs on corn, uh, 7 to 10% of the operating costs on wheat, and 6 to 8% on soybeans. So while we don't use nitrogen on soybeans, uh, we do use uh, phosphorus. So that, that, has a, that has an impact there. And so I guess <clears throat> what, I, what I wanted to show here is that moving forward, uh, when I'm talking about fertilizer, especially uh, this coming fall, and we're talking about pre-pricing and maybe into next spring, right now there's a, essentially a political barrier uh, that's been put into place uh, regarding phosphorus fertilizers. And <clears throat> so some of the traditional supply and demand metrics that you might use or mechanisms that would influence price, those get muted a little bit when you put a tariff in place uh, for, for, for those products coming in. Essentially, um, domestic producers are able to raise the price of that fertilizer up to the point, the cost that the import is plus the tariff in order for producers to be basically just as well off. And so when that happens, you're typically going to see a, a price increase and that price increase. I'm not, now I'm not saying that phosphorus prices can't go down in the future, but they're not going to go down as much as they would have had the tariff not been put into place. So we're probably looking at, for the foreseeable future, a new plateau on this specific uh, fertilizer commodity. And until any, until or unless something changes, that's probably the future we're looking at, uh, you know, indefinitely. And so, like was stated earlier, uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. I will be around at the end to answer any specific questions on phosphorus or any other fertilizer um, production concerns uh, and supply concerns. But with that, I believe Tim Petrie is our next speaker and I'll turn it over to him. Thanks, Tim. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Tim Petrie, Hand Use Extension Livestock Marketing Economist. Uh, glad to be with you again. Uh, just going to start off with weather again today, like I do a lot of times, a new drought monitor out this morning and uh, continuing improvement across the U.S. in uh, drought conditions, uh, still dry. And as I know, in southwestern North Dakota, and those of you out there are aware of that, uh, and from a cattle standpoint, you know, down in the New Mexico and, and uh, western Texas and up into uh, Kansas, still dry. But, you know, the main thing on the map on the bottom, again, that USDA puts out every time the new drought monitor comes out, is the dark green is the major cow-calf areas, and then the red soup 
lines superimposed there are drought. And important then from uh, when we start talking about uh, cattle herd rebuilding and so on, beef cow rebuilding is uh, the, in, circled in purple down in the lower left. Uh, now only 8% of the beef cows are in an area with drought. That's the lowest that it's been since 2019. Remember, we ended up last year, uh, 2023, at uh, about a third of our cattle still in drought. So we've seen significant improvement across the country in, in, in forage conditions and pasture and, and range conditions. And so that certainly is conducive to herd rebuilding. As I said before, and I'm not going to get into it in this uh, talk today that herd rebuilding is going to even though now uh, you know we have the forage conditions for it it's going to be slow simply because we didn't have a lot of uh, replacement heifers that were, were bred and then calved this year and so the replacement heifers that we do have are just uh, uh, the, the calves that we heifer calves we kept last fall so it's going to be a slow slow uh, process but then we're going to kind of take a longer term uh, picture look here and say how much herd rebuilding do we need and so we'll take a little bit of of history here. This slide, the uh, tan or orange colored um, uh, line there is the U.S. cow herd. This includes both beef and uh, dairy cattle. Uh, and so it's total cows that would give us, give us a calf crop. And then the blue line that's on the right hand side anyway is at the top is beef production. And so, you know, looking at our beef cow herd, uh, we're at our total cow herd, I should say, peaked in 1975 and has been declining kind of ever since. So what that means is that every cyclical expansion phase does not go up as high as the previous one. And therefore, the liquidation phase, uh, you know, outnumber the, uh, the uh, when, uh, when we accumulate again. And so uh, if history repeats itself, like it's likely, uh, even though we are going to see it, as long as weather conditions continue like they are, and again, that's anybody's guess on weather, but with the uh, record high prices and the better forage conditions, we're certainly uh, seeing with replacement heifer values and bread cow values and so on up at, at high levels that there is at least interest in and getting that going probably won't increase back up to where we were there at 41 million head in 2019, but we are going to do expansion. And the reason obvious on top of why the uh, we don't get back to the previous cyclical highs is because our beef production uh, has just continued to go up, up, up in, in spite of the cow herd going down. You know, beef production was an all time record high there in 2022 at 28.3 uh, billion pounds there. We have backed off the last couple of years this year, expecting uh, about 26.6 billion pounds, which is still uh, historically high, you see. And so we can we can produce a lot of beef with uh, the number of cows, even though they've been going down and, and you know, a lot of reasons there, we've, you know, the, the dairy cow numbers continually uh, go down as well relative to beef cows. And we're just getting uh, a lot more, a lot of technological advances in cattle feeding and so on. And, and we all know that cows have gotten uh, uh, bigger. So uh, we are going to expand maybe likely though not up to the level that we had in 2019. By the way, that's back when we had uh, moisture conditions like we have now. And so here, you know, is the reason again, why beef production is continually going up when the cow herd is going down. These are US average uh, steer weights, you know, on been going up, you know, there are a little, years when they go down a little bit but on the average about four pounds per year there uh again we peaked out in 2022 at uh at carcass weights for steers and 910 pounds we backed off just a little hair last year down to, to uh, 908 but uh uh you know uh, how long can this continue and certainly it's 
it you know our beef cow is going to continually get larger and larger and there's some indication now uh although not great that there is some leveling off and 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 maybe you know we won't see the increase at least the rate of increase in in beef cow weights that we have seen in the past but that remains to be seen but anyway looking at it you know what we expect for this year uh the the red line on the top are the carcass weights this year the blue line last year and then the purple line of course is the, the five year 2018 to 22 average and to begin this year we were uh, up there about 937 pounds and we fell off like we usually do seasonal more than the rate was more than usual in January there because we had uh, really bad winter conditions down in the cattle feeding area and that slowed up uh, cattle gains and so on and uh, it affected weights but we were kind of you know on the seasonal pattern to go down there and then when February hit all of a sudden we'd had a counter seasonal increase in weights up 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 and you know, into uh, by the end of February into March, then kind of leveled off, but there at 920 pounds. Uh, uh, last week, we were right at 920 pounds. That compares to a year ago, uh, 885 pounds. So, uh, you know, 35 pound higher your carcass weight this year than last year. And uh, kind of, uh, you know, it, it, probably that's going to continue. And what's the reason behind that is a couple of things. One is, of course, we've got a very short supply of feeder cattle. Again, we've talked about it before, the beef cow or down five straight years and, and calf crops. And so we've got a very short supply of feeder cattle. And then we've got record high prices. So uh, from what feedlots are doing is keeping the cattle longer, uh, instead of selling them because they have to replace them with such high prices and then their, you know, their feed costs have, have went down. Uh, last week, for instance, 750 to eight weight steers, although there weren't a lot of them in North Dakota, averaged $283 a hundred weight. So feeder cattle are very expensive. And so the feedlots, and the same thing actually happened back in 2015, right after the very high prices in 2014, the same thing happened is, is that uh, the feedlots kept them longer. And I got a ch chart to show you in a minute. The other thing is that packers are encouraging higher weights and for feedlots to keep, uh, keep steers and heifers longer to bolster beef production because beef production uh, so far is, is well it's off two percent this year we even expected to be off more than that but but due to these heavier weights that's adding to beef production but you know uh, beef production still down two percent and and uh, beef is moving at the retail level and so packers are encouraging heavier weights and uh, and and feedlots are are feeding them to to uh to heavier weights and so, you know, just slide just shows you the cattle on feed over 120 days is up uh, significantly from what it has been. Uh, again, just because of the short supply and, and the record high uh, prices for for those feeder steers. So, you know, looking at, at fed cattle prices then, again, fed cattle prices are up at record high levels like they have been all uh, year. In fact, two weeks ago, just over $190 there was an all-time uh, record high. And uh, the previous record high was it was back in uh, back in March there. And then before that, a year ago, we're, we're still a little bit above where we were a year ago when they were at record high. And then those red squares there were yesterday's closing uh, live cattle futures prices saying we'll be about at the same level that we were last year until the end of the year and higher. They were up, uh, live cattle were up again today. And so they'd be a little bit higher than this. And I think, you know, they could, those futures could actually do better and we could, uh, we could, uh, do better than the futures is indicating. The futures has been a little cautious here lately because of high path evening winds and dairy cattle and, and some of the stories around that and then the geopolitical issues and so on. The USDA is still predicting an average price for this year at 184. So, you know, they could do better than that. But anyway, we're at historic levels there, which is again, supportive to, uh, supportive to feeder cattle. And then if we switch gears a little bit here, 
and talk more maybe about the consumer level and demand for beef. Demand for beef is is holding in very well, better than some people thought that it might with uh, some of the issues that uh, uh, Dr. Parman has talked about in previous lectures. I mean, you know, we have have high interest rates and we have high credit card debt and, you know, some inflationary impact on the economy and so on. And yet beef is moving. This box beef cutout value then is what uh, packers can sell the meat into the, uh, you know, retail, wholesale retail and export sector. And so doing very well yesterday, uh, $316. Now it did spike last year, the blue line there, the red line is this year, did spike even higher for just a little bit last year. Usually seasonally, the beef cutout value does spike up because of the interest in uh, uh, barbecue season and, and, and during the summer and so on. And so that's, uh, you know, going on as normal this year, but, you know, uh, beef is moving very, very well at, at historically high prices, which is a testament to, to, uh, to demand there. And uh, so then, you know, just looking at some, uh, at some uh, uh, di different prices there and on the top, you know, for uh, uh, loin prices there, again, uh, I guess bad news for consumers, but, you know, just showing the very good beef demand that we have, yeah, prices of, you know, above last year, uh, the lighter blue line there throughout the year now, and again, showing that seasonal uh, peak there over $11 a pound uh, here with the, with the barbecue season going up. So uh, consumers, the good news for the beef industry and cattle prices is consumers are willing and able to pay and are, are paying the higher prices for beef and, and so on. And uh, kind of interesting if we go down to the bottom chart, just comparing it to the other uh, commodities, the purple line on the bottom is uh, chicken prices. And we see, you know, that they kind of uh, leveled out there in uh, a couple of years ago in 2022 and have been relatively stable. Chicken production is up. So that's part of the uh, going into that a little bit. And you go up to the light blue line there, in the middle of pork prices the same way kind of uh, you know have leveled off the last couple of years pork production is up a little uh, a bit as well and so that's influencing but on the beef side again we kind of have continued to inch up there but uh, beef production so far uh, this year is down about two percent and so that you know would aid into a little bit higher price there but but demand is there uh, beef is moving which is good news for the beef cattle industry. But again, you know, consumers are having to pay that price. So uh, with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Dave. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I just have a few comments uh, today about some developments in renewable diesel, just a bit of an update because there is a lot of interest in that product. Uh, there was about six weeks ago, a lot of news uh, in the biofuel space with some rules uh, set forth by the IRS regarding uh, tax credits for sustainable aviation fuel uh, and eventually for what they call calling clean, uh, clean fuels. Uh, it has very big ramifications, essentially, that farm level practices uh, can be incentivized, it will be recognized and, and consequently incentivized uh, with, with federal tax credits. Uh, pretty exciting news. Uh, really uh, kind of a watershed moment for the industry. Uh, but again, today I'm going to talk about renewable diesel. Uh, nothing really surprising here for the most part, what we've been expecting. Uh, production continues to increase uh, the demand, especially from those states, notably California with low carbon fuel standards have been, uh, created this market uh, that renewable diesel fits well into. Uh, there was some news uh, in the last few weeks, and it's kind of echoed back and forth. Uh, Scott Irwin from the University of Illinois has pointed out that margins are definitely being pressured in renewable diesel, uh, in part because of uh, the level set for renewable volume obligations for the RFS. Uh, at the same time, uh, we are seeing... You know, more product come online, more product being produced, but those margins have definitely been squeezed uh, to date. 
Um, just looking forward, this is some data also from uh, the Department of Energy, EIA, uh, that has a, it's from their short-term energy outlook that they put out monthly. Anyways, just looking a few years into the future, and again, we see that increasing uh, amount of both production and consumption. It's interesting that if we go from about the beginning of 2024, we had about 3 billion gallons uh, of production and use per year. And the expectation is by the end of 2025, we'll be up to 4.5 billion gallons. Uh, that would be right around possibly more than 10% of all diesel sales in the United States. In that case would be uh, renewable diesel. And if you remember talks from the past too, this is nothing about biodiesel. Biodiesel is maintaining uh, its market share for the most part. This is being built on top of it. Um, interestingly, you can look at imports as well. Uh, <laughs> the quiz of the day, if anyone can get it, it's pretty tough. Um, we, we have basically one supplier of renewable diesel for imports. Um, it happens to be a, a Finnish company that operates a refinery in Singapore. So they're sourcing a lot of feedstock in Southeast Asia and then importing into the United States. Uh, you know, if I if I broke up that chart into little segments, I could probably draw, draw lines that look like something is happening. Um, I'm not so sure that I'd be comfortable doing that. Maybe if we look in the last year and a half or so, we do see an upward trend with a, a lot of volatility. Uh, but it does play a, a large role. You know, a, a million barrels of uh, renewable diesel is is uh, is is noticeable. I mean, it's definitely a part of the consideration. That is actually per month. Um, so, I mean, it ends up being about, I think it ends up being about one seventh or so of, of U.S. use. And that's where we sit today. It'll be really interesting to see how things change going into the future. If we're going to be seeing... Uh, either imports of canola oil or imports of renewable diesel produced with canola oil from Canada, which might change those numbers significantly. Um, and then finally, uh, just looking, kind of breaking those numbers up a little bit. And this, this, these charts really don't tell much of a story. Again, one of the big things we see here among vegetable oil, soybean oil is the primary feedstock for biodiesel and renewable diesel production. Again, it's not the, 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 the dominant uh, input, again, we really like tallow and yellow grease, uh, very small carbon footprints. Uh, and what we saw in the beginning of this year in 2024 is a bit of a, a hiccup. And again, just relative prices can drive uh, the movement of, of these of these oils either into the biofuel market or or into the, the food market, uh, driven in, in, in some part by production. So, you know, you have a good canola crop, you have a lot of canola oil. Uh, prices dip just a little bit, put it in the money for use as a feedstock for biodiesel, renewable diesel. Um, looking forward, we know that these are the numbers that are going to have to increase, uh, you know, because we've essentially tapped out those other feedstocks. Exactly how quick that's going to happen and in what combination uh, among these, we really don't know. Uh, corn oil is probably a bit, of, it probably at its high end. Again, most of that corn oil comes from uh, ethanol refineries where they remove the oil and then and then sell it into these markets. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we're going to see more canola oil coming into this this biofuel market as well as soybean oil uh, in the coming years to meet that you know fifty percent increase uh, in production and use by the end of next year. So those were the comments that I had. Uh, be happy to answer any questions that might be uh, lingering out there. And of course, any other questions for Tim or Brian are, are welcome as well. And I don't know if anyone else has any comments after they gave their talk. I do have one kind of for you, Tim. So oftentimes you talk about BLTs and, <laughs> and pork bellies. I was in uh, Arizona last week and I happened to be visiting with one of the major importers of Roma tomatoes. And he's basically said that Romas are beginning to dominate the market and they're available year round. And that might change the BLT math a little bit. Yeah, but it's still everybody has when their tomatoes come on, they say, oh, boy, I'm going to have a BLT. And so then they go to buy bacon and that's the demand. So I think, you know, that's going to continue. And uh, 
you know, I, I guess down in the southern part of the U.S., maybe they are coming on. Uh, pork belly prices really spiked last week, which they usually do this time of the year and, and maybe even a bit, a little bit later. So, uh, I, yeah, I think uh, if you've got tomato plants in, I know mine are kind of laid up here because we've had all this rain here in the last month. But uh, but bacon is always does and is likely to be higher, they go, go higher than it is now. Well, I, I don't see any other questions coming online. Uh, our next webinar is a bit late in the month, uh, just based on when the WASD is released. Uh, it will be July 18th, which is a Thursday. It just happens to be the third yeah. Thursday of the month. Here is here is one for you. All right. Question, yeah. Wonderful. Oh, so let me. I'm going to have to dig into this one. Are there any estimates on what percentage of producers – that would be currently eligible to grow corn or soybeans for SAF? So this is a great question. So the rules that were released by the IRS in late April uh, were for a tax credit called 40B, which is related to the sustainable aviation fuel production. And much of that focused on, you know, what corn or soybeans would be eligible um, as feedstocks to produce a fuel, sustainable aviation fuel with a carbon footprint that was low enough to meet the threshold. So you have to be at essentially half the, the carbon footprint of, of jet fuel to meet the threshold. And modeling, would, and the numbers weren't, weren't specifically released, but as the rule came out, and essentially this is grandfather, this is the rule, uh, they identified three practices, and so that'd be no-till, cover crops, and then uh, high-efficiency uh, fertilizer. And so and that's actually a, a term used by NRCS, by USDA, which would include things like uh, coated urea, you know, extended-release urea and the like. Uh, and what they basically said is if, if corn is produced using all three of those, it would it would be eligible if used to make SAF. That SAF would have a carbon footprint small enough to to qualify for this forty B credit. Uh, on the soybean side, they said that a, a a farmer would have to have at least use at least two of those three in order for those soybeans to be able to be used for SAF to qualify for that credit. And now the the concern and the and the major pushback uh, from commodity groups from farmers is that these are practices the the fertilizer is actually pretty you know pretty easy to do the other two are not i mean you know th there's a lot of folks who don't understand a you can't just you know not every field is is really in a position or you know based on the soil or the agroclimatic conditions to be no tiller to really sustain cover crops in you know in the northern plains we have a short season so the idea that you could put a cover crop in uh, for corn is is a stretch most years. Uh, so there was a lot of pushback on that. And the question that was asked was, you know, specifically what percent. Um, so I don't have that number. The one thing I would bring up right now is there is only one SAF plant in the country uh, and it's in Georgia. It's 20 million gallons. So it only needs 25,000 acres of, of corn in order to meet its needs. But the really important thing and, and, and you know supports the the value of the question is we're really just getting started that is really a clue to what another tax credit which is 45z the clean fuels tax credit is going to to allow and it also you know when you're grandfathered in on the wrong side you have to find a way to get to the other side and that's really going to be difficult for many corn uh, producers especially to be able to do um, and so again there was a lot of public pushback on that and I, I think we'll see where it goes the one thing that I bring up in all of this is you know we're talking about one of many possible ways in which farmers can receive value for uh, reducing emissions or capturing carbon in the soil 
And in this case, it seems that, you know, most farmers are really not going to be able to produce a crop that would qualify. Uh, there are other options. Um, there are other ways that they can do that. You could sign a carbon offset contract. You could sell insets to uh, a food company, to a, to a grain marketing company that provides a premium. Uh, but again, you know, just based on the rule that the IRS, you know, released, the, the final rule, you know, that the amount of, of production that's eligible is unfortunately really small. Um, the other thing I would note too is that's SAF and it will be clean fuels. There are likely other ways to even the biofuel space um, that corn will still be able to get some premium. Soybeans would still be able to get some premium in the market. Uh, but it's, you know, it, it it does, at least on its face, uh, eliminate a lot of, of production that could have gone into that market um, and and more to come. And that might be a lot for folks uh, who are kind of new to this, not familiar with it. If, if you and maybe I didn't explain it in, in the best way in, in five or 10 years, everything I said will be common, common language, part of the jargon in agriculture, you know, in terms of decarbonization in terms of SAF, in terms of 45Z, um, it, it's all there. Um, one thing, the last point I would point out, and it is really important, is, you know, we really are seeing a segmentation in the market. Um, and, you know, thinking mostly about biofuels, but also about food crops uh, and other crops and livestock, you know, that carbon footprint is starting to matter uh, in a tangible way. Uh, and it's not a five or a 10 year from now thing. It's a today thing. And, you know, farm individual farmers and, and agriculture collectively needs to be really thoughtful about positioning itself well. Uh, because if you're if you're not informed and not making the right decisions, you could find yourself missing out on, on, on certain market opportunities, which could be detrimental to your to your operation. Um a, a, a long answer, but it is a it's a it's a, a bit of a complex situation and, and, and an, an important situation for for agriculture. I think that's all that we have. No further questions. You know, if, if you give a seven minute answer to a question, people don't want to ask a second question. Um, but with that, I want to thank everybody for joining us, for Tim, Brian and Frayne for, for participating today. And we'll see all of you in July. Thanks. Thank you.